Okay, so we are going to continue talking about the network layer. Okay, and so far we've talked about some addressing, right? Um, the, basically, the, 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 the hierarchical structure of IP addressing. Okay, so we're going to move on to a function called NAT. So this, this is all stuff that's implemented at, at, at network layer. Okay, so NAT stands for Network Address Translation. Okay, and uh, NAT does two things. Um, I mean, I mean, there's there's a bunch of, of motivation here. So, but but I'm going to explain it uh, on this diagram here. Okay, so what what NAT does is it creates. A private network. Okay, so this part of the network here, oh, I don't know how that happened. Maybe this is better. Let's try this. So, NAT creates, so imagine this part of the network is going to be private. Okay, so so in some sense, what it does is it creates a network that is not connected to the rest of the internet. So on, on this diagram here, we see the rest of the internet, and we see our private network. So this gives us a couple of benefits. OK, uh, Benita, last time you asked about um, shortage of IP addresses, right? Well, this helps with that. because. In a private network, you can reuse IP addresses. So, for example, if you wanted to in your private network, you could use Google's IP address. It doesn't matter because the rest of the world does not see the private network. Okay? So, so that's one of the benefits. Let's, say, let's try to write it here. So really shortage of IP addresses, OK? So this is sort of the obvious benefit. Uh, now, if you remember, I mentioned to you once. So, so for those of you who just walked in, we're talking about NAT. NAT stands for Network Address Translation. And the function of NAT is to create a private network, to isolate the private network from the rest of the internet. And we're talking about what's the what are the benefits of doing that. One benefit of doing that is to relieve the shortage of IP addresses. Right? You remember IPv4 addresses are 32 bits. And 2 to the power of 32 is about 4 billion. So there's only about 4 billion IP addresses. Um, well, we're going to run out, out, out of them soon. Right? So this allows, in a private network, IP addresses can be reused. Okay, and that's how it relieves this. Now, uh, I mentioned to you before that there are certain ranges of IP addresses that, that are reserved for private networks. Uh, specifically, 192.168. So, for example, maybe I list them here. So, private addresses, so 192.168. Then 172, oops. 172.x and 10.x. Okay, these are reserved for private networks. You will never find an IP address on the internet with these prefixes. All right? Uh, but since the private network is actually disconnected, you can use any IP address you want. Right? So th those of you who have network access now, can, can you find your IP address? Yeah, so remember, for those on a Mac, you just go to terminal and type ifconfig. That's it, ifconfig, I think. If you're on Windows, you go to a, um, a command prompt and type uh, ipconfig slash all. So can, can people tell me what are your, your IP addresses? Or if you're on an iPad, you, you should be able to find in the... What's your IP address? 
Yeah. It's not going to be this. Yeah, I'm just, so it's good, good, good. So tell me. So how about you guys on the NUS network? What's your IP address? 10 dot, right? How about the rest of you? It's likely going to be 10 dot if you're on, on the wireless, it, it looks like. How about you? Did you find it? It's okay, just find it, it's fine. Take your time, okay? So, all right, so it, it, it creates a private network. Benefit, it relieves shortage of IP addresses. Okay, now, if that was the only benefit, you might question it because IPv6 has 128-bit IP addresses. And two to, two to the power 128 is a very big number, right? I, I, I don't know if somebody managed to find out uh, how many atoms there are in the observable universe? Did, did anybody can search it for me? I think it's like 10 to the power 80, right? So 8 is 2 to the power 3. So that's 2 to the power 240. So maybe they, it, that's not the number of, of, but okay, it's a number of observable, it's the number of atoms in, in our solar system, okay? Maybe it's not universe. I don't know. Somebody can double check me. But if that was the only reason, not very, let's say, compelling. Uh, can anyone think of another reason why you might want to create a private network? Why you might want to isolate the network on the right from the network on the left? On the left is the internet. On the right is my private network. What? Yeah? Security. Security, exactly. That's the second big reason. Okay? The second big reason is security. And to me, it's really the primary reason, okay? Uh, th this is why what we're about to talk about for NAT is identical to a firewall, identical to a VPN. Those are all the same device, okay? They have the same exact function. Okay, it's just here I call it NAT, right? But VPN, firewall, all the same thing. And, and, and you know VPNs and firewalls are for security, right? So this is, so, so, okay, so what we mean when we say that the network on the right is isolated, what we mean is that the internet is not able to see the nodes in the private network. The internet, nodes on the internet on the left, they are not able to see the node, so if you notice on the way I created is there's gonna be this router here, okay? You can think of this as my NAT router, okay? And you can see this NAT router has two interfaces. Remember, remember every interface of every router creates a network or a subnet. So to the right of the NAT router is my subnet, my private subnet. Okay, and there happen to be three clients hanging off that uh, router interface, right? 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.2, Did you find your IP address? Yeah, it's probably Singtel, right? You, what? Oh, you, you can go to uh, whatismyipaddress.com. Oh, you, you did that? Yeah, I did that. Oh, it's not? Okay. I th okay, interesting. Okay, good. All right, so, um, yeah, so, so, so this, this NAT router, okay, is, is what's creating the private network. Okay, we'll talk about how it's doing it in a second. But what we mean when it says private or, or isolated, nodes on the left cannot see nodes on the right. Nodes on the left only see the NAT router. So when you look in this way, you only see one node with this IP address, 138.76.29.7, that, that, that's made up. But that's a public IP address, right? So no, normally when we say public IP, we mean things visible on the internet. Private IP, things not visible on the, on, on the internet. So right now, I'm not telling you how we are creating the private network or how we are doing the isolation. I'm just pointing out NAT is doing isolation why, what are the benefits? Okay, are we good? Okay, so, so, so in, in, in this context, there's a few things you would need to talk about. If this network is truly, let's say, private, 
you could ask the question, is it, is it air-gapped? What we mean by air-gap, meaning, is it like completely disconnected from the internet in the sense that when we say air-gap, like, like there's no wire at all. This is not air-gap, right? Because there's a router there. But you know, there's some networks, like for example, the hospital. Some of the hospitals in, in Singapore for the production network, they're air, air-gap networks. Right? If you notice recently, the, the, in the last few years, there were some breaches right, of, of, of some of the hospital networks, and some private data got out. So they, they decided to really clamp down and create air-gap networks. Right? So if you're military, you probably want to create an air-gap network. This is not an air-gap network. But nonetheless, nodes on the left cannot see any of the nodes on the right. But, nodes on, but um, the interesting thing is nodes on the right still have internet connectivity. They still can function as if they're on the internet. Meaning, you can surf the web. Right? So think about when you're at home. Your home, there's a, uh, a modem from, the, from your ISP. That modem is the NAT router. And it's, when you're at home, you can surf the web, you can make FaceTime calls, right? You can do all sorts of things. So you're not completely, it's not air-gapped. But nonetheless, we'll see later, or when we see how this is done, nodes on the left, the internet, cannot see the nodes on the right. So that means they cannot attack them. Like, they can't do port sweeps. So one of the ways you attack, a hacker attacks a computer, is they do a port sweep. So remember, I told you about ports at the transport layer. Ports correspond to processes. Processes listen on ports. So somebody could just start sending packets to with a certain port number and see if, does any process respond? And that's how you can actually hack into a, a computer. If your ports are not secured, you can find open port and get access, get on, get a terminal, start doing, doing all sorts of bad things. OK? So, right, so we would need to talk about how is it that a node on the left can actually access the internet. Now, it turns out, if you're at home, you might think, wait, wait a second. Uh, you, know, the, you know, I just said nodes on the left cannot see nodes on the right. But when you're at home, your friend can WhatsApp you, right? Can even set up a WhatsApp call to you. Wait a second. That, that sounds like somebody on the outside is connected to somebody on the inside. So how, how are we going to reconcile what I said, that nodes on the left cannot see nodes on the right? So we've got to figure that out. So th there's a few questions that should come to your mind, right? So again, learning is really all about asking questions. So if it, it's, I, I get the sense that sometimes we get a little bit um, comfortable and just listen to facts from people, right? But you should be uncomfortable. You should, somebody tells you a fact, you should ask a question, why? Are you sure that's true? Okay, and that's how you learn. That, that, that's how you enhance your own learning. All right? Okay, so let's move on. Um, okay, so, so, so f uh, from this example, we're going to figure out how NAT creates the private network. All right? So roughly what happens is, in high-level words, this NAT router... It masquerades as everyone in the private network. Meaning, this NAT router has, so this, this right here is my NAT router. OK? And behind the NAT, there are these three nodes, right? So. High level, without technical jargon, what the NAT router does is it pretends to be all of those nodes. Okay, so the rest of the world only sees when you look in this way. You only see the NAT router. So all the packets leaving the network look like they're coming from the NAT router. 
all the packets coming into the network look like they're going to the net router. So that's it. That's how the isolation happens. Okay, so if somebody wants to attack the, the network, they can only attack the net router. They can't attack anybody else. Right, so essentially you've created a single point of failure. But you can secure that single point. Right, so for example, um, uh, the, those folks co are, co are connected to the Wi-Fi. Like, uh, uh, did you find your IP address before? Can you also go, to, or can all of you go to a website called, like, or, or just Google, what is my IP address? And I think the website is called whatismyipaddress.com. Can you try going, going, going to that? What, what do you see? But that wasn't your IP address, right? You, when you told me your IP address by doing, you're on a Mac, Mac, right? You, when you type IF config, what was your IP address for your, for, I think it should be EN0, should be your wireless. What's your IP address? Yeah, 10.249.something. And as we said before, that's a private address. But when you go to whatismyipaddress.com, what's your IP address? One what? 137.132. That's actually, and does it tell you it's NUS? Did, did it do a, um, that website should try to do a reverse lookup and tell you, it, 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 it give you a guess. Does it say NUS? Yes, yeah, so because 137132 is our domain. So you see, this is the NUS gateway. Right? You're seeing the IP address the world sees the IP address of the NUS gateway. It doesn't see your 10.249, okay? Because when you send a packet, eventually the NUS gateway is gonna do what NAT is doing. It's going to masquerade as you. It's gonna take every packet and it's gonna change the source IP to itself. So let's maybe talk about exactly, okay? So, so, Packets, so if we look at, um, so maybe we'll just look at um, packets leaving 10 dot, I mean, this is a little bit overlap here, but, but, but this should be, um, yeah, maybe I need to just move this a bit. Oh, I don't know what that is. Why, why is that not? Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is 10.0.0.1. Okay. So every packet leaving this node, well, the source IP is going to be 10.0.0.1, right? And so this is my host. It sends a, a datagram to this, this computer. This is some company and it's port 80, so this is like an HTTP packet, so I'm, this 10.0.0.1 is trying to surf the web. So the source is itself, and by the way, this 3345 three, is a port number, but what is it the port number of? So I, I'm, I'm claiming that the source IP will be 10.0.0.1, and the source port will be is I'm telling you it's three three four five. So what is that, Max? That's for example the port that I Yeah, yeah, correct. And more specifically, it's probably the tab, because every tab is a new process. Okay. So and then we see the the destination IP and and the destination port. So that's what leaves ten dot zero dot zero dot one. And now. The NAT router has IP address 10.0.0.4. So actually, the routing algorithm will choose 10.0.0.4 as the next hop. Okay, and that will maybe show up in the routing algorithm, and maybe you need to know the MAC address of the router to because they're they're on the same subnet, right? So you know, on the subnet level, it's the MAC address is used to filter, right? So anyway, so the packet will eventually get here. 
what the NAT router is going to do is it's going to make a modification to, to, to the packet. It's going to change the packet, the, the IP packet, so that so the destination remains the same. But the source is going to be the NAT itself. And, well, this is strange 5001 here. Why, why do you think that, like, what, is 5001 is, is the port of which process? So I, I, I somehow, I, I converted, the, the, the NAT converted 3345 to 5001. Why? 5001 corresponds to what? Yeah, port of what? Which host? But the packet came from the process, the web browser, as Max said, the tab is listening on port 3345. Yeah, why did I change it to 5001? But where is 5001? Uh huh. And so, is 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 there any process on port five thousand one? So, yeah. So, why does the NAT router have a tab? There, there's no web browser running on the the NAT router. Is there? Is is the NAT actually trying to send the packet? The packet's coming from 10.0.0.1. Max, give me a sec. So, so what do you think is, is going on, folks? What, what do you think is happening here? So I, I told you what, what's happening high, high level, right? The NAT router is masquerading as all of the nodes in the network. So let's see if we can do a little bit of thinking. <laughs> Again, this is not very complicated. This is not a trick. So, so you're almost there. It's to identify 10.0.0.1, but not just 10.0.0.1. To identify something else. Be a bit more precise. You're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. On the NAT router, I need a way to identify 10.0.0.1 port 3345. Why, why do I need, need to do that? So let's see if we can close the loop. If you can, you understand that completely. Why do I need to do that? Yeah, yeah, it's masquerading, but, but why do I need to be able to identify it again later? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Max? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, correct, because, because the message that, that went out could be a request. There's going to be data coming back, right? And the NAT router is not a web browser. The, the NAT router is not a person or a user. The user is at 10.0.0.1. So when the data comes back, the NAT needs to send it back to the right host, to the right process. So this is just housekeeping. It's just a bit of clerical work that the NAT router has to do, right? It's going to map 10.0.0.13345. It's going to map it to 1387629.7 port 5001. And then you notice at the top, he has to keep track of that. Why is he keeping track of it? So that when a packet comes back, the packet that comes back, well, the source will be the web server. What's the destination? It's not 10.0.0.1. It's the NAT router at what port? Port 5001. So data will come back here. The NAT will look in its translation table and, well, that's why it's called the translation, NAT network address translation, because it's translating addresses. It's going to have to translate back, back to 10.0.0.1, port 3345. And that's what it does, and that's point four. Okay? So I change it on the way out. I keep track of how I change it, and I change it back on the way in. So this is very similar to something else we discussed at the transport layer. Does anyone remember? What? 
Yeah, this is when we, the whole idea of port was necessitated because we needed a way to address a process. And the multiplexing and demultiplexing was at the device level. At the interface, I have to multiplex and demultiplex. You can see this as multiplexing at the network level. The NAT is the interface, right, to the network. So that's why port numbers make sense here. Because it's essentially the same thing as multiplexing and demultiplexing. Okay, so this is good. This is quite, you guys are very good at this. You, this is the first time I think collectively you got it on almost the first try. Good. So any questions about that? So as I said, IPv6, we're still going to have NAT. Because even though there's not a shortage of IP addresses, it gives you the security. Okay. All right, good. So, oh yeah, yeah. So, 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 a couple of problems, right? What problem? Uh, oh yeah. So, not um, the port number is sixteen bits. So, you can roughly compute how many simultaneous connections you can have and all that stuff. A little bit co uh, controversial because it violates layering. Remember, port number is a layer four header. And this is a layer three process. It's OK. We live with it. OK, if you ever want to change transport layer or network layer, you've got to keep this in mind. You can't change it arbitrarily. So this is actually a violation of the, the layering, uh, protocol layering. OK, so, okay, so let's go back to here. So 10.0.0.1 can surf the web. We saw how. But it turns out that my friend outside can Skype me, can WhatsApp me, can FaceTime me. Yeah, how, how, how is that possible? Because I thought the network here cannot see me, can only see the net router. And the net router is not me. My Instagram is not running on the net router, or my FaceTime is not running on the net router. So how is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's stop there for a minute. So what, what Max is saying is that translation table up there, I can advertise it. I can tell everybody, I can put it on my Instagram or I can make a TikTok video about it, that if you want to contact me, you can send packets to this to 1387629.7 port 5001, right? And then if you do that, it, you'll respond because the NAT is configured to route it back to you, right? Yeah. So that's, that's one way. And you can do this like manually or you can semi-automate it. Okay, so th those are the two, I think, the, the first strategy that Max spoke, spoke about is essentially that. You advertise your, um, like how you can be reached. Basically, the left-hand side of the translation table. Okay, and as I said, you can, you, can, you can do it manually, which is what I'm showing here. You can statically co uh, configure it and advertise it, or you can automate it. This, this, um, this universal plug and play protocol here, it's, it's, it's just the same idea, but automated. Okay, you had a second idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the 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 second the the third solution, which is what's used um, right now, is to have a third party relay, right? Essentially, as as the example uh, shown here. For example, I'm giving the e e example of Skype. 
So Skype is a server, uh, is a, is a, is a third-party relay. It exists on the internet, so it's accessible by everybody. We already know how in the private network can access the internet, right? The NAT is going to masquerade. And we know it doesn't matter. Some, your, your other, I mean, your friend or you know, whoever wants to co communicate with you can also contact Skype. Whether they're on the public internet or private, it doesn't matter. But both of you contact Skype. And now, of course, Skype can be the relay. Can just, you know, so now instead of having to advertise that, Skype can relay how are these two parties that want to communicate, how are they contactable? How are they reachable? That's it. Yeah, and that's essentially how Skype, FaceTime, WhatsApp, that's how all those work. And you already know that, right? Because when, when you log on, like if you log on to Telegram, what's the first thing it does? If, 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 if you don't have an internet connection, it will tell you you don't have an internet connection, right? I think WhatsApp doesn't tell you, but it tells you when somebody's online. How does it know if, some, if, if somebody's online? There's a relay, okay? So th this is how we basically solve the NAT traversal problem. How do you like, make it look like the NAT is not there? But luckily, yes. Uh, by the way, in Skype, for example, when you do this, you, you might think that all the traffic goes through Skype or your third party really. It, it, it doesn't. The traffic is peer-to-peer, is -peer, right? It wouldn't scale if all WhatsApp calls or FaceTime calls went through the central server, you'd have a scalability issue, right? So that thing is only used to connect the two, right? Eventually, traffic flows in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, I mean, using the internet. OK, are we good? So we understand NAT. We understand NAT traversal, right? OK. Uh, OK, so uh, I, I just, I just want to wrap up what else is implemented at the network layer. So we, so we have IP, we have NAT. Uh, we also have something called ICMP. So ICMP is internet control message protocol. And again, I'm not going to get into the details. If you really want to and you need to code it or whatever, you just look up the spec and you find it out, OK? But like ping and trace route fall into um, ICMP, OK? Uh, finally, we look at the sort of the next generation of the internet protocol called IPv6. Uh, does anyone know what happened to IPv5? Actually, I don't know. If you can find out, that, that would be great. Uh, but IPv6, basically, the next evolution, it, it introduces a bunch of enhancements. So um, uh, first thing it does is it creates a um, 128-bit IP address. OK? Uh, it creates a flow label. Right? Remember, um, when we looked at rethinking the end-to-end -end principle, we argued that Perhaps if we identified flows, we could do things better. So this does that. Okay, I think it introduces, uh, it changes the, the header to be fixed length and doesn't allow fragmentation. Okay, so it, so the fragmentation and reassembly that we talked about is only for IPv4. Okay, um, uh, I mean it does a few other things. I, I, I think it removes the checksum at the network layer, and there's some updated versions of the other protocols, OK? Um, the one interesting thing is, how do you transition from v4 to v6? Uh, you, you know, given the scale of the internet, you cannot flip a switch. You cannot say, OK, Jan 1st, 2024, everybody go to v6. Not going to happen. OK, so we need to have a, a way to gracefully evolve from v, v4 to v6. And that is done through something called tunneling, OK? Um, in, in, in tunneling, what we do is, is we create a logical tunnel um, between, let's say, v6 routers. So the v6 routers just see the v6 network. But some of the v6 routers are special. They can talk v6 and v4. So for example, here, 
if I have a, a V6 network here and a V6 network here and this tunnel, this tunnel could essentially be a V4 network. And this V6 node and this V6 node has been configured to talk V6 and V4. So it will take the V6 packet here and it will wrap it in a V4 packet. And then it will traverse the V4 network and this network, this node is configured to strip that off. Okay, so this is how you can become independent of everyone having to switch at the same time. Right? Certain devices in the network, certain routers, have to be configured to talk both. Okay, and this is how we get graceful evolution of V6 and V4. Uh, I think I think V6 is in use now. If uh, you, the folks who were helping me me before, if you go to your IF IF config, you should also see a V6 address. Can you check if you see a IPv6 address? Can you see it? Yeah? Like, uh, are you on your, what do you want? You, you can see both, v, v4 and v6? Yeah. Okay, so as I said, it's, it's, it's happening. Soon, we'll see v4 starting to go away. Okay, okay, that's it. So, end of, of, of IP. Okay, so we understand addressing, right? The, the important takeaways here are the hierarchical nature of IP addresses, okay? And, like, like, and, and the fact that routers do forwarding and routing, right? We talked about the forwarding, longest prefix matching. Now we're gonna talk about routing, the routing algorithms, okay? What are the algorithms that nodes use to find these paths, right? We said the main job of network layer was to find a path. So this is routing, okay? So, okay, let's start this and we'll finish this next Monday, okay? But we'll start it today because we have some time, okay? So if you recall this diagram, we've, we've seen it before. It's the interplay between routing and forwarding. Nodes have a forwarding table that they use to figure out, based on the destination, figure out what's the correct interface to forward to. Well, it's the routing algorithm. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be our abstraction Okay, we're going to abstract the network as a graph. Okay, so a graph has edges. So, so on this graph here, which represents my communication network, there's three things to, uh, to take note of. One is there are vertices, there are edges, and there are labels on the edges. So three things, okay? You have nodes. These vertices in the graph represent my routers. The edges in the graph represent my links between routers. And the labels on the edges represent some form of cost. All right? Um, I'm going to use cost as a generic term. Okay, it's a general term. Okay, it could represent actual cost. It could represent delay. There's a variety of things that this cost could represent. Okay? Uh, and, okay, so this is gonna be our, our abstraction. And the routing problem then is, uh, what is the least cost path between two nodes? So in, in, in this case, I'm, I'm taking you as my source, node U, and node Z, okay, so node U here is my source, and node Z is my destination. And I could ask the question, what is the least cost path between U and Z? So to convince you that you can do routing, can you solve that on this, on this network? What's the least cost path?
Yeah, this is a question for you. It's not a rhetorical question. Rhetorical means you can think about it and not answer. Dijkstra is not the least cost path. So I want you to just use your eyes. U to X to Y to Z. That's certainly one path from U to Z. Why is this the least cost path? How did you get that? Okay, so you kind of intuitively figured out that if you have links with certain costs, a path, the cost of a path is just a sum of the costs on the edges, right? Great. But why is this the least cost path? It's certainly one path. Why is U, X, Y, Z? So the suggest, what's your name? Spell it for me. Uh, Su Chin said it's, um, let's, you, get, you said it's U, X, Y, Z. So explain why this is the least cost path. How, how do you get that? Uh, don't say Dijkstra. There's, there's no Dijkstra here. There, no, where, where, where do you get Dijkstra? But, but why, why, you guys love technical jargon. Yes, you'll be very happy on the final exam because I'm going to give you lots of technical jargon. Come on, common sense. So, Sichin, why? I'm not saying you guys are wrong, but 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 just you know, the, there's this there's this um, flaw that everyone, including me, we fall into, which is that when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Have you guys heard this? When you have a hammer, everything is a nail. But sometimes, but you know, everything is not a nail. So don't, don't need to bring your hammer. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, why are you bringing a hammer? Yes. Why, why is this the least cost path? How did you figure it out? Yeah. Yeah, so you basically did it, sort of inspection, but like essentially exhaustive search, right? You kind of tried to find, and, and actually you, you might not have it. If I ask you to prove it, you might write down all possible paths, right? And show me this is the, the least cost path. It, it turns out in this case it is. This is the least cost path. And it's, the cost, by the way, is four, right? But... The point I want to make here is not um, like about algorithms. The point I want to make here is that if you ever forget or get confused about routing, come back to this slide. Because I've convinced you you know how to do routing. Right? A routing algorithm just solves the problem, helps a machine to solve the problem you just did. Tichin. It, solves, it, it, it enables a machine to solve what you just did, okay? So keep in mind, you know routing, okay? This is the, the routing problem is shown here. Now, if I made the problem bigger, if I made the network bigger, you know that the number of paths will grow actually combinatorially. So it's going to grow much bigger. It's going to get much harder. The hope is, and this is true, we're going to find algorithms that... Yeah, the complexity will grow, but the idea remains the same. Okay, and as people were insisting, yes, we'll look at Dijkstra. Okay, all right. Okay, good. So are we good here? Do we? Under so the the point here is you know routing. Okay. So we're going to look at two types of algorithms. One is centralized. 
Okay, when we say centralized, we mean it knows the topology of the network, it knows all the nodes, knows all the connections, knows all the costs. This algorithm will be called link state, and the example of link state that we'll look at is Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, then the second approach to solving this problem is going to be based on based on not knowing the entire network, but only knowing local information. And that will be a decentralized approach or a distributed approach. And for that, we'll look at the distance vector algorithm. Okay, so two things, link state, distance vector, Dijkstra, and is based on something called Bell, uh, Bell, uh, Bellman Ford. Um, now, we'll typically just assume that, at least for link state, that the network is static. If the network is not static, you need to rerun the algorithm. For the distributed, the, the distance vector, it can kind of adapt to changes. So it automatically adapts to changes in the network. Okay, are we good? Do we see where we are going? Okay, these are the two algorithms we're gonna study. And maybe this is a good place to stop, okay? So when we come back on Monday, we'll talk about link state, or, or Dijkstra and distance vector. So that'll be our goal for Monday, to finish that. And then hopefully the following Wednesday, we'll wrap up network layer. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, if you have questions, uh, I, I can stick around for a bit.